I've got some news for you, and I'm not sure if it's a threat or a promise, but I'm going to begin to make videos on topics in science, philosophy, and economics. These videos are going to be academic in nature and a bit complex, but I will do my best to popularize them and to make them accessible even to laymen. Not an easy task, even for me. So, the first topic I would like to explore is the universe a computer? More precisely, is the universe a quantum computer? Now, we're all acquainted with these speculations that maybe our reality is actually a simulation within a computer, which in itself could be a simulation within another computer, in a kind of nested simulation. The whole question collapses if we were to accept that simulations are forms of reality, that they are real. And indeed, calculations show that it is much more likely that we inhabit or reside within a simulation than within what we prefer to call reality. The distinction strikes me as a bit artificial. Additionally, we cannot design tests. The, the assumption or the hypothesis that we are living in a simulation is non-testable. It cannot be falsified, is non-falsifiable, so it can never be scientific. It's a kind of fantasy or, I don't know, feel good or dystopian fantasy, depending on which side of the simulation you are. So back to the topic. Today we are going to explore a specific branch of mathematics and logic in the attempt to answer the question, is the universe a computer. And we go all the way back to 1936, when an American, yes, there were such Americans at the time, when an American by the name of Alonzo Church and a Briton, a British guy by the name of Ellen M. Turing, published independently, as is often the coincidence in science, independently published the basics of a new branch in mathematics and logic. At the time, this new branch was dubbed computability or recursive functions. Later, it had evolved in, into what we know today as automata theory. The authors, the original authors, Church and Turing, confined themselves to dealing with computations which involved effective or mechanical methods for finding solutions or results. And these results could also be expressed as solutions or values to formula. So, there was a kind of a two-tier requirement. The first requirement was, whatever computations take place, they need to involve effective or mechanical methods for finding results. In other words, they need to involve what we call today computers. And these results there was a second tier or second condition. These results must be expressible, must be expressed as solutions or values to formulate, to equations. Now, these methods were so called because they could, in principle, be performed by simple machines or human computers or human calculators, to use Turing's unfortunate phrases. The emphasis was on finiteness, a finite number of instructions, a finite number of symbols in each instruction, a finite number of steps to the result. And this is why these methods were usable by humans without the aid of an apparatus, with the exception of pencil and paper as memory aids. Moreover, no insight or ingenuity were allowed to interfere or to be part of the solution-seeking process. So, while the authors had emphasized mechanical methods for finding results, they didn't go one step further. They did not posit or postulate the existence of machines, mechanical devices. On the very contrary, they emphasized human independence of machines, humans' ability to perform these calculations given a sufficient number of resources, resources and sufficient time. What Church and Turing did was to construct a set of all the functions whose values could be obtained 
by applying effective or mechanical calculation methods. Turing went further down Church's road. Turing designed the Turing machine, a machine which can calculate the values of all the functions whose values can be found using effective or mechanical methods. So Turing took the next step. He said, it's not enough for humans to be able to do this. We can create a machine who's going to do the, which is going to do the same. Humans can do it. If humans can do it, a machine can do it. And he called it the Turing machine. And so the program running the Turing machine, Turing machine is, is, um, is the predominant feature of this presentation. So the program running the Turing machine was really an effective or mechanical method. Humans could use this method. Machines could use this method. Church solved the decision problem for propositional calculus. And Turing proved that there is no solution to the decision problem relating to the predicate calculus. Now, that sounds very erudite, very ingenious, and very profound, which is exactly my intentions. But let's try to translate it into human speak, also known as English. It is possible to prove the truth value or the theorem status of an expression in the propositional calculus, but not in the predicate calculus. That's as simple as that. Later, it was demonstrated that many functions, even in number theory itself, were not recursive, meaning that they could not be solved by a Turing machine. No one succeeded to prove that a function must be recursive in order to be effectively calculable. This is, as Post noted, Post was a scholar, this is a working hypothesis supported by overwhelming evidence. It's like white swans, you know, all swans are white until proven otherwise with a single black swan. Right now, as the situation stands, function, functions that are effectively calculable, can be calculated, are usually recursive. We don't have an exception. We don't know of any effectively calculable function which is not recursive. And so, by designing new Turing machines from existing ones, we can obtain new effectively calculable functions from existing ones. And Turing machine computability stars in every attempt to understand effective calculability. Or these attempts are reducible or equivalent to Turing machine computable functions. The Turing machine itself, though abstract, has many real world features. And in this sense, it is the precursor and the antecedent of today's computers. The Turing machine is a blueprint for a computing device with one ideal exception, its unbounded memory. The tape in the Turing machine is infinite, unlike hard, hard disk storage, for example, or tape storage in computers, in real computers. Despite its hardware um, pretensions, this, despite it, the, its appearance as hardware, because the Turing machine is a read, write head, which scans a two-dimensional tape inscribed with ones and zeros. The Turing machine was the first description in writing in an academic article of a computer with a head that can read and write and an infinite two-dimensional tape transcribed with binary code. So it, Turing machine misleadingly appears to be some kind of hardware specification, but it is really a software application in today's terminology. The Turing machine carries out instructions. It reads, it writes, it counts, and so on. It's functional, it's function-based. It is an automaton designed to implement an effective or mechanical method of solving functions of determining the truth value of propositions. If the transition from input to output is deterministic, we have a classical automaton. If it is determined by a table of probabilities, we have a probabilistic automaton. With time, not to mention hype, the limitations of Turing machines were all but forgotten. No one can say 
that the mind, for example, is a Turing machine because no one can prove that it is engaged in solving only recursive functions. We can say that Turing machines can do whatever a, a, a digital, digital computers are doing today, but not that digital computers are Turing machines by definition. Maybe they are, maybe they are not. We simply can't prove it. We do not know enough about digital computers and we don't know enough about Turing machines and we don't know enough about the future of digital computers. And we can definitely, definitely not say with any rigor that digital computers can solve or calculate only recursive functions as Turing machines do. Moreover, the demand that recursive functions be computable by an unaided human seems to restrict possible equivalents, including hardware equivalents. Inasmuch as computers emulate human computation, they are Turing machines. Turing did believe so when he had helped construct the ACE, ACE, at the time the fastest computer in the world. Functions whose values are calculated by aided humans with the contribution of a computer are still recursive. It is when humans are aided by other kinds of instruments that we start to have a problem. If we use measuring devices to determine the values of a function, it does not seem to conform to the definition of a recursive function. So we can generalize and say that functions whose values are calculated by an aided human could be recursive, depending on the apparatus used and on the lack of ingenuity and insight. But they could also be non-recursive. Ingenuity and insight being anyhow a weak, non-rigorous requirement, which cannot be formalized. Onward, Christian soldiers, let tra let's transition to the real world, or at least our beliefs about the real world. Quantum mechanics is a branch of physics which describes the microcosm. It is governed by the Schrodinger equation. This Schrodinger equation is an amalgamation of smaller equations, each with its own space coordinates as variables, each describing a separate physical system. The Schrodinger equation has numerous possible solutions, each one of them pertaining to a possible state of the atom in question. These solutions are in the form of wave functions, which depend again on the coordinates of the system and on their associated energies. The wave function describes the prob probability of a particle, originally the electron, to be inside a small volume of space defined by the aforementioned coordinates. And this probability is proportional to the square of the wave function. This is a way of saying we cannot really predict what will exactly happen to every single particle. However, we can foresee with a great measure of accuracy what will happen if, what will happen if a large population of particles is involved. Where will they be found, for instance? And this is where the first two major difficulties arise. To determine what will happen in a specific experiment involving a specific particle, an experimental setting, an observation must be made. And this means that in the absence of an observing and measuring human, flanked by all the necessary measuring measurement instrumentation, the outcome of the wave function cannot be settled. It just continues to evolve in time, describing a dizzyingly growing repertory of options. Only a measurement, the involvement of a human, or at least a measuring device which can be read by a human, only this reduces the wave function to a single solution, collapses it. A wave function is, as the name implies, a function. Its real result, the selection, of, the selection in reality of one of its values, is determined by a human equipped with an apparatus. So, is the wave function recursive? Is it computable by a Turing machine? Is it compatible with a Turing machine? The answer is not as obvious as it seems, because intuitively or reflexively or intuitively you might say no. There's a human involved, and this human is aided. No Turing machine computability. But in a way, 
the wave function is Turing machine computable. Computable. Its values can be effectively and mechanically computed. The values selected by measurement, thus terminating the propagation of the function and its evolution in time, by zeroing um, its its other terms, bar the one selected. So the value selected by measurement is one of the values which can be determined by an effective mechanical method. I'm going to repeat this. I'm going to repeat this because it flies in the face of a lot of received wisdom. When the measurement selects a value of the wave function, it terminates the propagation of the function. It terminates the evolution of the function in time by zeroing rendering zero all its other terms except the one selected. So the value selected by the measurement is one of the values which can be determined by an effective mechanical method. So how should we treat the measurement? No interpretation of quantum mechanics gives us a satisfactory answer. It seems that a probabilistic automaton which will deal with semi-recursive functions will tackle the wave function without any discernible difficulties. But a new element must be introduced to account for the measurement and the resulting collapse. Perhaps a boundary or a catastrophic automaton will do the trick. The view that the quantum process is computable seems to be further supported by the mathematical techniques which were developed to deal with the application of the Schrodinger equation to a multi-electron system, atoms more complex than hydrogen and helium. The Hartree-Fock F, 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 okay. Hartree method assumes that electrons move independent of each other and of the nucleus. They are allowed to interact only through the average electrical field, which is the charge of the nucleus and the charge distribution of the other ele electrons. Each electron has its own wave function, known as orbital, which is a rendition of the Pauli exclusion principle, actually, coming to think of it. The problem starts with the fact that the electric field is unknown. It depends on the charge distribution of the electrons, which in turn can be learned from the wave functions. But the solutions of the wave functions require proper knowledge of the field itself. It's a chicken and egg. It's a tautology. And so the Schrodinger equation is solved by successive approximations, asymptotically. First, we guess at a field. We postulate a field, literally out of nowhere, honestly. We postulate a field. Then we calculate the wave functions. The charge distribution is derived and fed into the same equation in an iterative process to yield a better approximation of the field. And the whole thing starts again. This process is repeated until the final charge and the electrical field distribution agree with the input to the Schrodinger equation. But we just said that we iterate. We just said that there is an iterative process to approximate the field. Recursion and iteration are close cousins. The hartree fock method demonstrates the recursive nature of the functions involved. We can say that the Schrodinger equation is a partial differential equation which is solvable asymptotically by iterations which can be run on a computer because they are essentially kind of recursive. Whatever computers can do, Turing machines can do. And therefore, the hartree fock method is effective and it is mechanical. There is no reason in principle why a quantum Turing machine could not be constructed to solve Schrodinger equations of the resulting wave functions. The special nature of this quantum Turing machine will set it apart from a classical Turing machine. It will be a probabilistic automaton with catastrophic behavior or very strong boundary conditions, akin perhaps to the mathematics of phase transitions. Classical Turing machines, Turing called them logical computing machines. Classical Turing machines are by definition macroscopic. Quantum Turing machines will be microscopic. Perhaps while 
Classical Turing machines deal exclusively with recursive functions, effective or mechanical methods of calculation. Quantum Turing machines could deal with half-effective, semi-recursive, iterated, probabilistic, catastrophic, and other methods of calculations, other types of functions. And this leads us, finally, <laughs> to the universe. The universe is kind of a third tier, where all the functions have values. The universe is infinite. All the functions have values, ultimately. From the point of view of the universe, the equivalent of an infinite Turing machine, all the functions are recursive, because all of them are effective. All of them can be solved via effective mechanical methods. The universe is the, do the domain or the set of all the values of all the functions. The functions are recursive. All of them are effective mechanical methods for solution. And so this domain, this set of all the values of all the functions is the universe. Its very existence guarantees that there are effective and mechanical methods to solve all the equations. No decision problem can exist on this scale or all decision problems are positively solved at this scale. The universe is made up only of proven, provable propositions and theorems. This is a reminder of our finiteness, and to say otherwise would surely be intellectual vanity. But of course, to move further, we need to delve a bit deeper to the issue of quantum mechanics, or to the issues posed by quantum mechanics. Arguably, the most intractable philosophical question attached to quantum mechanics is measurement. The accepted, also known as Copenhagen, interpretation of quantum mechanics says that the very act of sentient measurement, intelligent measurement, conscious measurement, determines the outcome of the measurement in the quantum micros microcosmic realm. The wave function, which describes the coexistent superposition states of the system collapses, resolves, following an act of measurement. It seems that just by knowing the results of a measurement, we determine the outcome of a measurement, determine the state of the system, and by implication, the state of the universe as a whole, as the universe changes when such a solution is found. This notion is so counterintuitive that it fostered a raging debate which has been going on for more than seven or nine decades now. But can we turn the question, and inevitably the answer, on its head? Is it a measurement that brings about the collapse? Or maybe we are capable of measuring only collapsed results? Maybe our very ability to measure, our very capacity to design measurement methods and measurement instrumentation to conceptualize and formalize the act of measurement. Maybe everything we have to do with measurement, these are limited in design, so as to yield only the collapsible solutions of the wave function, which are macrocosmically stable and objective. These are known as pointer states. Indeed, pointer states are reminiscent of the strange attractors of chaos theory. Most measurements are indirect. They tally the effects of the system on a minute segment of the environment. Wojciech Zuek and others proved that even partial and roundabout measurements are sufficient to induce a Einselektion or environment-induced superselection. In other words, even the most rudimentary act of measurement is likely to probe pointer states. Superpositions are notoriously unstable. Even in the quantum realm, they last an infinitesimal moment of time, tiny moment of time. A measurement apparatus is not sufficiently sensitive to capture superpositions. By contrast, collapsed or pointer states are relatively stable and lasting, and so can be observed, can be measured. This is why we measure only collapsed states, because of our limitations and limitations of our instrumentation. But in which sense, excluding the longevity, in which sense are collapsed states measurable? What makes collapsed states measurable? 
Collapse events are not necessarily the most highly probable. Some of them are associated with low probabilities, yet they still occur. They're still measured. By definition, the most probable states tend to occur and tend to be measured more often. <laughs> Definitely. The wave function collapses more frequently into high probability states. No one is denying this. But this does not exclude the less probable states of the quantum system from materializing upon measurement. Pointer states are carefully selected for some purpose within a certain pattern and in a certain sequence. What could that purpose be? Probably the extension and enhancement of order in the universe. That this is so can be easily substantiated by the fact that it is so. Order in the universe increases locally all the time. The anthropocentric and anthropic view of the Copenhagen interpretation. Conscious, intelligent observers determine the outcomes of measurement, measurements in the quantum realm. These views associate humans with negentropy, the decrease of entropy, increase of order. This is not to say that entropy cannot increase locally and order decrease or low energy states attained. Of course it can and does. But it is to say that low energy states and local entropy increases are perturbations, disturbances, and that overall order in the universe tends to increase even as local pockets of this order are created all the time, perhaps in a compensatory manner. The overall increase of, of the overall increase in order in the universe should be introduced, therefore, as a constraint into quantum mechanic, mechanics formalism. That's an unusual view, as quantum mechanics is usually, usually subjected to thermodynamics, second rule. Yet surely we cannot attribute an inevitable and invariable increase in order to each and every measurement, to each and every collapse. To say that a given collapse event contributed to an increase in order, which is an extensive parameter, and that increase in order is systemic throughout the universe. To say this, we must assume the existence of some grand design within which this statement would make sense. Such a grand design, such a mechanism, must be able to gauge the level of orderliness in any given moment, for instance, before and after the collapse. Such mechanism must have at its disposal sensors of increasing or decreasing local and non-local order. Human observers are order-sensitive instruments, and so maybe that's why they are the ones to detect collapse. Still, even assuming that quantum states are naturally selected for their robustness and stability, in other words, for their orderliness, even if we accept this, how does the quantum system know about the grand design and about its place within this mechanism? How does the system know to select the pointer states time and again? How does the quantum realm give rise to the world as we know it, objective, stable, certain, robust, predictable, and intuitive. If the quantum system has no a priori awareness of how it fits into an ever more ordered universe, how is information transferred from the universe to the entangled quantum system and measurement system at the moment of measurement? Such information must be communicated superluminally at a speed greater than the speed of light. Instantly. Quantum decisions are instantaneous and simultaneous, while the information about the quantum system's environment emanates both from near and far to the furthest corners of the universe. What are the transmission mechanisms? What are the reception mechanisms and channels? Which is the receiver where is the transmitter? What is the form of the information? What is the carrier? We will probably have to postulate yet another particle to account for this last question. Another, no less crucial question, relates to the apparent arbitrariness of the selection process. All the parts of a superposition constitute potential collapse events. 
and therefore can in principle be measured. Why is only one event measured in any given measurement? Why not multiple events? How is this event selected to be the collapse event? Who does the selection? What does the selection? Why does, why does this event retain a privileged status versus the measurement apparatus or measurement act? It seems that preferred states have to do with the inexorable process of the increase in the overall amount of order in the universe. If other states were to have been selected, order would have decreased or diminished. The proof is again in the pudding. Order does increase all the time. Therefore, measurable collapse events and pointer states tend to increase order by definition. There is a process of negative order oriented selection. Collapse events and states which tend to increase entropy are filtered out and statistically avoided. They are measured less. There seems to be a guiding principle, a principle of statistical increase of order in the universe. This guiding principle cannot be communicated to quantum systems with each and every measurement because such communication would have to be superliminal. The only conclusion is that all the information relevant to the decrease of entropy and to the increase of order in the universe is stored in each and every part of the universe, local copies. No matter how minuscule this part is, no matter how fundamental this part is, even a particle, even a quark, they carry a copy of, the, of this uh, blueprint, a copy of the directive to increase order. It's a little like DNA. This is the DNA of the universe. It is safe to assume that very much like in living organisms, all the relevant information regarding the preferred order favoring quantum states is stored in a kind of physical DNA. The unfolding of this physical DNA takes place in the physical world during interactions between physical systems, one of which is the measurement apparatus. Biological DNA contains all the information about the living organism and is replicated trillions of times over the lifespan of the organism. It is stored in the basic units of the organism, uh, like the cell. What reason is there to assume that nature deviated from this very pragmatic principle in other realms of existence? Why not repeat this winning design in, for example, elementary particles? A biological variant of DNA requires a biochemical context, an environment, to translate itself into an organism, an environment made up of amino acids, etc. The physical DNA probably also requires some type of context, some type of environment. And this environment is what we call the physical world, as revealed through the act of measurement. The information stored in the physical particle is structural because order has to do with structure. Very much like a fractal or a hologram, every particle reflects the whole universe accurately, perfectly. The same laws of nature apply to both particles and the universe that contains them and is made up of them. Consider the startling similarities between the formalisms and the laws that pertain to subatomic particles and, for example, black holes. Moreover, the distinction between functional, operational and structural information is superfluous. It's artificial. There is a magnitude bias here. We are creatures of the macrocosm. Um, and as creatures of the macrocosm, because we are very big entities, relatively speaking, form and function appear to us to be distinct. But if we accept that function is merely what we call an increase in order, then the distinction is cancelled because the only way to measure the increase in order is via form, structurally. We measure functioning, the increase in order, using structural methods, for example, the alignment or arrangement of instruments. And still, the information contained in each particle should encompass at least the relevant, close, non-negligible, non-cancelable, parts of the universe. This is a tremendous amount of data. How is it stored in such tiny corpuscles, such um, uh, corpuscles, such tiny bodies? 
like elementary particles? Where is the energy stored in an electron or a neutrino, let alone in a quark? Well, either by utilizing methods and processes which we are far even from guessing, or else the relevant information is infinitesimally, almost vanishingly small. The extent of necessary information contained in each and every physical particle could be somehow linked or even equal to the number of possible quantum states, to the superposition itself, or to the collapse event. It may well be that the whole universe can be adequately encompassed in an unbelievably minute, negligible, tiny amount of data, which is incorporated in those quantum supercomputers that today, for lack of better understanding, we call particles. Our universe can be mathematically described as a matched or PLL filter whose properties let through the collapsed outcomes of wave functions when measured, or they let through the signal. The rest of the superposition of the other universes in the multiverse can be presented as noise. So we can reconceive of the whole thing as a filter. Our universe, therefore, enhances the signal to noise ratio through acts of measurement. And this is a generalization of the anthropic principle and comes perilously close to the Kabbalistic idea that humans complete creation and complete God with their actions. I refer you to two articles, Olivier, Paulin and Zurich in Physical Review Letters, volume 93, 2004, and Zurich, an archive, uh, archive preprint in 2004. Let's go even deeper. The problem of continuum versus discreteness seems to be related to the issue of infinity and finiteness. The number of points in a line served as the logical floodgate which led to the development of set theory by Cantor at the end of the 19th century. It took almost another century to demonstrate the problematic nature of some of Cantor's thinking. Cohen completed Gödel's work only in 1963. But continuity can be finite. The connection is, most times, misleading rather than illuminating. Intuition tells us that the world is continuous and contiguous. This seems to be a state of things which is devoid of characteristics other than its very existence. And yet, whenever we direct the microscope of scientific discipline at the world, we encounter quantized, segregated, distinct and discrete pictures. This atomization seems to be the natural state of things. And so why did evolution resort to the false perception of continuum and continuity? If it is counterfactual, if there's no continuity in the world, why do we imagine it? Why do we perceive it? Why do we impose it on our theories? Now, how can a machine, which is bound to be discrete by virtue of its naturalness, for example, the brain, how can such a machine perceive continuum? The continuum is an external mental category, which is imposed by us on our observations and on the resulting data. It serves as an idealized approximation of reality, a model which is asymptotic to the universe as it is. It gives rise to the concepts of quality, emergence, function, derivation, influence, force, interaction, fields, quantum measurement, processes, and a host of other holistic ways of relating to our environment. The other pole, the quantized model of the world, conveniently gives rise to the complementary set of concepts quantity, causality, observation, classic measurement, language, events, quants, units, and so on. So the private, macroscopic, low-velocity instances of our physical descriptions of the universe, of our theories, they tend to be continuous. Newtonian time is equated to a river, a flow, a flux. Space is a yarn, a fabric. Einstein was the last classicist. Relativity just means that no classical observer has any preference over another, any privileged position in formulating the laws of physics and in performing measurements. But Einstein's space-time is a four-dimensional continuum. 
what commenced as a matter of mathematical convenience, was transformed into a hallowed doctrine. Homogeneity, isotropy, symmetry became enshrined as the cornerstones of an almost religious outlook. God doesn't play dice. These were assumed to be objective, observer-independent qualities of the universe. There was supposed to be no preferred direction, no clustering of mass or energy, no time, charge or parity asymmetry in elementary particles. The notion of continuum was somehow interrelated. A continuum does not have to be symmetric, homogeneous or isotropic, and yet somehow we will be surprised if it turned out to not be so. As physical knowledge deepened, a distressful mood started to prevail. The smooth curves of Einstein gave way to the radiating singularities of Hawking's black holes. These black holes might eventually violate conservation laws by permanently losing all the information stored in them, which pertain to the masses and energies that they had assimilated. Singularities imply a tear, a tear in the fabric of space-time, and the ubiquity of these creature, uh, creatures completely annuls the continuous character of space-time. There are so many black holes. There are more holes than fabric. It's like a homeless typical set of clothing. Modern superstrings and supermembrane theories, like Witten's M theory, talk about dimensions which curl upon themselves and thus become non discernible, torn apart from the fabric. Particles, singularities, and curled up dimensions are close relatives. Together, they seriously erode the tranquil continuity of yore. But the first serious crack in the classical intuitive Weltanschau was open, had opened long ago with the invention of the quantum theoretical device by Max Planck. The energy levels of particles no longer lay along an, an unhindered continuum. A particle emitted energy in discrete units called quanta. Others had developed a model of the atom in which particles did not roam the entire interatomic space. Rather, particles circled the nucleus in paths and trajectories which represented discrete energy levels. No two particles could occupy the same energy level simultaneously, and the space between these levels, between these orbits, was not inhabitable, non-existent actually. The counter-continuum revolution spread into most fields of science. Phase transitions were introduced to explain the behavior of materials when parameters such as pressure and temperature were changed. All the materials behave the same in the critical level of phase transition, yet phase transitions are discrete, rather surprising events of emergent order. There is no continuum which can accommodate phase transitions. The theory of dynamical systems, better known as chaos theory, has also violated long-held notions of mathematical continuity. The sets of solutions of many mathematical theories were proven to be distributed among discrete values called attractors. Functions behave catastrophically in that minute changes in the values of the parameters result in gigantic divergent changes in where the system settles down, where it finds a solution. In biology, Gould and others have modified the theory of evolution to incorporate qualitative, non-gradual jumps from one step of the, of the ladder to the next. The Darwinian notion of continuous, smooth development with strewn remnants, missing links, attesting to each incremental shift, this view has all but vanished and expired. Take psychology, for example. Psychology has always assumed that the difference between normal and deranged is a qualitative one, and that the two do not lie along a continue, continuous line, a spectrum. A psychological disorder is not a normal state exaggerated. exaggerated, it's distinct. So psychology started as a discontinuous pseudoscience. Ironically, it's now reverting to continuum principles. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, edition 5, is a continuum or spectrum-based book. The continuum way of saying things, the way of seeing things as continuous within a continuum, is totally inapplicable, philosophically and practically. There is no continuum of intelligence quotients, IQ, 
And yet the gifted person is not an enhanced version of the mentally or intellectually challenged one. There is a non-continuous difference between 70 IQ and 170 IQ. They are utterly distinct. They are not reducible to each other. They are not extrapolation of each other. Another example, many and few are value judgments or cultural judgments of elements of, of a language used. Big and small are the same. And though theoretically both are points on a continuous line, they are quali qualitatively disparate, distinct. We cannot deduce what is big by studying the small, unless we have access to some rules of derivation and decision making. The same applies to order disorder, element system, evolution revolution, not alive, alive. The difference between inanimate and animate, not alive and alive, is at the heart of the applied ethical issue of abortion. When should a fetus, an embryo, begin to be considered a live thing? Are viruses forms of life? What about prions? Life springs suddenly. It is not more of the same, it's not a cumulative result. It is not a matter of quantity of matter. It is a qualitative issue, almost in the eye of the beholder, if you wish. All these are problems that call for a non-continuum approach for the discrete emergence of new phases, order, life, system. The epiphenomenal aspect, properties that characterize the whole, that are nowhere to be found when the parts comprising the whole are examined. The epiphenomenal aspect is accidental to the main issue. The main issue the main issue is the fact that the world behaves in a sudden, emergent, surprising, discrete manner. There is no continuum out there, none, except in some of our descriptions of nature, and even this seems to be for the sake of convenience or aesthetics. But renaming or redefining a problem can hardly be called a solution. We selected the continuum idealization to make our lives easier, but why does it achieve this effect? Why, when we use continuum in physics or other disciplines, suddenly we gain explanatory power, interpretative power, the ability to predict and to hypothesize? In other words, why does introducing continuum, why does it work? In which ways does the continuum simplify our quest? to know the world in order to control the world and thus enhance our chances to survive. There are two types of continuum, spatial and temporal. All the other notions of continuum are reducible to the, one of these two. Consider a wooden stick. A wooden stick is continuous, it's finite. You know, finite and continuous are not mutually exclusive or mutually exhaustive. So the stick is finite, but it's continuous. Yet, if I were to break the stick in two, its continuity will have vanished. Why? Why can the action of breaking the stick has rendered continuity moot, made it disappear? How can my action have influenced what seems to be an inherent, extensive property of the stick? We are forced to accept that continuity is a property of the system that is contingent and dependent on external actions. This is normal. Most properties of systems are like this, temperature, pressure. But what made the log continuous, the stick continuous before I broke it, and discontinuous following my action, my aggressive action, um, is unclear. Was the discontinuity generated by my violence when I broke the stick? Was it because of it? It is the identical response to the outside world that might provide us with a clue. What made the log continuous before I broke it? What made the log discontinuous following my action when I broke it? Is the identical response to the outside world. All the points in the macroscopic stick would have reacted identically to outside pressure, torsion, twisting, temperature, etc. It is this identical reaction that augments, defines and supports the mental category of continuum. 
where it ends discontinuity begins this is the boundary this is the threshold breaking the wooden stick created new boundaries now pressure applied to one part of the stick will not influence the other the requirement of identical reaction will not be satisfied and the two newly broken parts of the stick are no longer part of the same continuum the existence of a boundary or a threshold is intuitively assumed even for infinite systems like the universe this plus the identical reaction principle are what give the impression of continuity the pre-broken wooden stick the wooden stick before i broke it satisfied these two requirements it had a boundary and all the points in the stick had reacted simultaneously to the outside world in an identical manner yet these are necessary but insufficient conditions discrete entities can have boundaries discrete entities can react simultaneously as a group and still be highly discontinuous consider for example a set of the first 10 integers first integer numbers this set has a boundary this set will react in the same way simultaneously to a mathematical manipulation for example multiplication by a constant but there's a crucial difference here all the points in the stick retain their identity under any transformation and under any physical action if they're burned they will all turn into ash all the points in the stick also retain their relationship to one another the structure of the stick the mutual arrangement of the points the channels between them the integers in the set will not each will produce a result and the results will be disparate and will form a set of discrete numbers which is absolutely distinct from the original set the second generation set will have no resemblance whatsoever to the first generation set in some cases it cannot be reverse engineered we cannot deduct or derive the first set from the last example heating heating the wooden stick raising the temperature will not influence our ability to instantly recognize the wooden stick as a wooden stick and as the wooden stick if we burn the wooden stick we'll be able to say with assuredness that a wooden stick had been burned at least that wood had been burned but the set of integers in itself does not contain the information we need in order to tell us where it came from what was the set that had preceded it and so additional knowledge would be required the exact laws of transformation the function which had been used to derive this particular set so that we can go backwards reverse engineer the wooden stick conserves and preserves the information relating to itself the set of integers does not we can generalize and say that a continuum preserves its information content under manipulation and transformations while discrete entities discontinuous entities or discrete values behave idiosyncratically and so do not preserve this information in the case of a continuum no knowledge of the laws of transformation is needed in order to extract the information content of the continuum the converse is true in the case of discrete entities or values these conditions the existence of a boundary or a threshold the preservation of local information and the uniform reaction to transformation or action these rules these conditions are what made the continuum such a useful tool in scientific thought Paradoxically, the very theory that had introduced non-continuous thinking to physics, quantum mechanics, is the one that is trying to reintroduce continuum right now. The notion of fields is manifestly continuous. The field exists everywhere, simultaneously. Action at a distance, which implies a unity of the universe and a continuity of the universe. Action at a distance was supposedly exercised by quantum mechanics only to reappear in space-like interactions. Elaborate and implausible theoretical constructs are being dreamt up in order to get rid of the contamination of continuity, but it is primordial, a primordial sin, not so easily atoned for. The measurement problem is at the very heart of quantum mechanics. If the observer had actively participated in the determination of the state of the observed system, which admittedly is only one possible interpretation, but if the observer had participated in this determination then we are all observer and observed 
members of one and the same continuum. And it's discreteness which is imposed on the true continuous nature of the universe. Einstein was a Newtonian, a deterministic natural philosopher. And like Newton, Einstein accepted the pre-existence of space-time and of masses. As a physicist, he did not bother with the question of where did these masses or space-time come from. They were just a given. Einstein's innovation was to suggest that gravity was a language element, the word we use to describe the impact that masses have on the shape of space-time, and also the word we use to describe the effects of acceleration. On the other hand, some of the assumptions that philosophers make are indefensible. Masses have properties. Time-space could be one of these properties. It is not a multiplication of entities. Parsimony is preserved and actually enhanced. Instead of having two entities, space-time and masses, now we have only one, masses with a space-time property. Next, we could assume that for masses to interact, they must be embedded in a medium, a container. And this was, of course, the thinking in the 19th century. The medium was called the ether. But of course, there is no rigorous way to support such an assumption. Modern physics rejects it completely. Space-time is not a pre-existing medium or a container within which masses exist and interact. It is the outcome of such interactions, not a precondition. Like God itself, it is a premise which adds nothing to our understanding and is totally dispensable. We can offer a comprehensive explanatory description of the universe, including falsifiable predictions, without insisting on space-time as a boundary condition. My work and the work of uh, Eitan Suchard assumes that masses are aspects of time, but I see no need to add any further conditions. Intuition and common sense have no place in physics. I refer you to my video on the chronon field theory in this channel. It is definitely a bad scientific practice to add yet another third entity to account for the effects of masses on space-time. It defies Occam's razor and parsimony. It adds nothing to our understanding of the world because we are managing very well without it. Space-time, masses, and geometry are language elements. They are epistemic entities that correspond to observations. It is debatable whether they have any precise, monovalent, mappable, ontological equivalents. They are useful as shorthand and they are conducive to communication and so they yield falsifiable predictions. But they do not possess any extraneous meaning out there in reality. They are context-dependent and theory-specific. For example, in my theory, there are no masses, no space-time. And I've managed to describe the universe and account for all the phenomena in the universe perfectly with my theory. And just to clarify, when I use the phrase comprehensive explanatory description of the universe, I mean a language that yields falsifiable predictions. That is the best that we can ever aspire to, to know everything about the language that we are using, to leverage this language to yield predictions about future observations, not about reality. Reality is inaccessible to us. Only our observations are accessible to us. We need to be able to falsify these predictions in experiments. Only bad physicists presume to explore the world and to, to reach out for the truth. Science is asymptotic to both. The universe may be the set of all calculable functions in the infinite automata that some people call God.